Hey, this is Jason with InheritedLand.com, and I am here today with my good friend, Logan Swanson with PrimeLandBuyer.com. Now, Logan is a land investor, and I have the privilege of interviewing him today to talk about common problems that he has faced uh, when working with people that want to sell land that they've inherited. So uh, Logan has bought hundreds of parcels of vacant land in 15 different states over the last several years. Uh, welcome to InheritedLand.com, Logan. Hey, thanks, Jason. So Logan, when we work with buyers, and I've mentioned this in other uh, videos here on the site, uh, I'm also a land investor and I've dealt with this, and I'm sure maybe you've even dealt with it more extensively than me, which is why you're on here today. What are some common problems that you see? And we're not talking about any old person that wants to sell land that they have, but typically and specifically with the people who have land that they've inherited, maybe grandma had passed away and left them a piece of land to them and some siblings, or maybe, um, you know, recently they've inherited it. What are, you know, a couple common problems that you see when you've worked one-on-one -on -one with, with sellers of, of land they've inherited? Yeah, we've, we've done a whole lot of this. Um, so probably the most common issue that you're going to run into is a will that just wasn't probated. Um, most most folks think someone passed away there was a will it said i got whatever the property the house the piano whatever um and that's it they think it's theirs now uh, but there's a legal process that you have to go through uh which can be a bit of a pain um in order to ensure that that will is finalized and executed um and all of that real property is actually transferred and deeded into your name uh, so that's probably one of the most common ones. And we've seen this where people have been paying property taxes for years and years on, on land that they've inherited and they don't have an equitable title. What do you mean by equitable title in the land? So I, I see the same thing happen. People reach out to me. A lady yesterday said, I have this piece of land in Texas, this farm. I'd like to sell it. You know, it was my grandpa's. It still shows his name on the county records, but my mother paid the property taxes for 10 years and she passed and I've been paying them for the past 10 years. What do you mean by equitable title? Yeah, so um, it's not like owning a piano, owning land. Uh, there's specific documents that need to be filed with the county um, as record of ownership. So that's typically deeds. Deeds can take a lot of different shapes and forms as far as the legal types. But <clears throat> most common is somebody will have inherited a property, but that ownership transfer never occurred um, through those documents. Maybe there was a deed that was never passed over where it was signed, uh, executed by a judge, and then filed with the county. That's usually the most common one. Now, the local uh, tax assessor is going to be really quick to find out who should be paying those taxes. So a lot of folks will think, I've been paying taxes, so I must own the property. But in fact, it might still be, quote unquote, owned by the deceased person. And now you have to go back and kind of do some of this cleanup, or we as investors oftentimes are able to guide you through that. Yeah, this is actually uh, one of the main issues. And another interview who are on the site with... Uh... Scott Royal Smith, an attorney who was talking about how to set up your estate so this doesn't happen. He said, a will is not good enough. It's better to put it in a trust. The trust is easier to deal with. But you did mention the will needs to be probated. And so uh, to clarify that process, a deceased person cannot deed property. No one can sign. Power of attorney doesn't matter once they're deceased and gone. What their will or, or the trust documents, living trust estates is what's going to be ha happening in their, their airship and in their estate. But that, if it's a will, needs to go before a judge. The judge needs to clarify that, yes, this will is valid, this happens, and then there will be a transference of the deed. So if we were to go to the county recorder's or clerk's office, depending on the state, is the property in your name or not? So what you're saying is you find a lot of people where I'm paying taxes, it comes, the tax bill comes to me because they're wanting their taxes right away. But if we were to go to the county clerk's or recorder's office and look up the deed, is your name on the deed? If your name's on the deed as a sole owner, you can be the person that has equitable title to sign and sell. But if not, something else has to happen, correct? Yeah, and you can't sell something that you don't own. And that's usually where 
we start running into issues. Um, our process is pretty simple. You know, we'll start uh, when we're interacting with someone who's interested in selling their property. First thing we do is we go to the county and try to find that deed because uh, that's really how you determine who has the authority to sell it. Hmm. Yeah. So let's just say you said that you have worked with people like this. The will was not probated. Something needs to happen. My name is not on the deed. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have a right to the airship or to the inheritance, but it means that a step has to happen. So what is your process to determine what steps have to happen um, you know, in that process when working with a seller? Yeah, so uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to go back uh, and do a little further digging to ensure that the person that passed away that maybe willed the property uh, that they had rightful ownership of it. Like this can get really, it's an onion. You know, you keep going back further and further and you can find out that the person that thought they owned the property and then willed it to somebody else, actually there's a gap or an issue in chain of title there. So mm -hmm. first thing we do is we go back and make sure everybody up to that deceased party um, had properly done the documentation. Then we're going to look at uh, the person who's maybe trying to sell the property that had inherited it um, and look at how long ago was this person deceased? You know, is there other assets that are in that will that would make sense to actually go through and formally complete the probate process? Uh, because there's costs associated with it. And depending on the value of the property, um, it might not make sense. I mean, we buy properties that are worth a few thousand dollars here and there, and it's just not going to be worthwhile to go through the whole probate process. Um, and there's a lot of different state rules. So a lot of what we know and we're really good at is focused in Texas. So in Texas specifically, there is a document that you can use called an affidavit of heirship in lieu of a probate, of actually probating the will. And what that's going to do is it's something that you can record with the county stating that there is no other party that has interest in ownership of this uh, property. Uh, and then you need witnesses to sign off on it. Depending on how complex or potentially complex the number of heirs involved, et cetera, you actually want more and more witnesses. Um, and those witnesses have to be third parties with knowledge of the family. So they would have to know the deceased and they would have to know or know of the potential heirs. Um, and they have to be disinterested, meaning I can't start paying people to be a witness on an affidavit of heirship. Um, but the document itself is pretty simple. It's actually just saying, hey, I know that, you know, John Doe is deceased. He had one child, no other children out of wedlock, no other claim, anyone who would have a claim to this property. Uh, so I will state that the only heir from my understanding of the situation is so-and-so. Um, we usually try to get two to three witnesses to sign off on that, again, depending on the value of the property or how complicated the airship structure is. Hmm. So uh, that is good news in the state of Texas. There are a few states. Uh, Missouri also has affidavits of airship. There are a few others that do. Some do not. Um, and this obviously is not legal advice as we're not attorneys. And you would want to consult with an attorney. We do have some attorney interviews here on the site. You can reach out to one of their offices. Um, or we, in the process, when we evaluate to buy land, we often will do these affidavit of airships or these processes. We work closely with an attorney that will prepare these documents and walk you through this process. Um, so the good news is there sometimes are situations that can be fixed. And an affidavit of airship, even if there wasn't a will in place, right? If the will is in place, it's best to just probate that, go through the right process. If not, there are options like the affidavit of airship. There's another process. Now, when things are really messy and it goes back a long ways, and you, you mentioned something, we call it the chain of title. So if, you know, uh, it was grandpa or great grandpa, and I'm, we're working with a lady with a ranch in Texas right now that her grandfather passed away the ladies in her 80s so her grandfather was a while ago and he did not deed it right to his children who did not deed it right to their children so there's cousins and it's quite a mess but what is a quiet title process i've heard people say well it, you know worst case we need to go through quiet title uh, because there's such a big cloud or so many issues around the the ownership transfers 
of this this land that was inherited. Um, have you ever dealt with that? And what situations um, do you see that as an option for? Yeah, so we've actually, we've never gone through pie title, uh, though I am familiar with it. I've talked to a number of people that have done it. Um, we typically don't do it, uh, usually because I haven't found a case that was valuable enough for me to go through that full process. Uh, quiet title is a process where you're effectively suing to find out who has ownership of this property. A judge will then weigh in on that lawsuit. And when he signs off and says, um, this individual owns the property, then that clears the chain of title and establishes a sole owner. Uh, the way that they'll typically do that is they're going to advertise in local newspapers to find out who has ownership of this property. They're going to reach out to all these potential heirs. And it's a judicial and legal process. You're usually going to need, I think you always have to have an attorney. Yeah, you're definitely going to need an attorney to go through that process with you. And really, you want an attorney that specifically understands this process and can do it quickly and efficiently. Because I've heard of people that have done quiet title in under a month and other quiet title suits that have extended into a year. Um, sometimes they're relatively affordable, but sometimes you don't know all the costs that are gonna be involved in that process. So um, it, it is really nice because at the end of it, you do have a legal document signed by the judge, filed at the county, clear, insurable title to own, the owner of that property. Um, but it is, it's a process. It's a legal process that takes a Obviously a legal process also requires time and it requires a, a substantial investment of capital because you know, this with attorneys, judges and processes involved in the legal system, there's going to be a cost. Um, of course, quiet titles vary. Uh, I've heard the minimum is usually around $5,000 for smaller par uh, properties that are cleaner and then it goes up substantially from there. However, that could be maybe the final straw if the situation looks really bad and uh, nothing else could be done. You can sue for quiet title. And what you're doing is quieting the claims of other potential claimants back in the family line. Uh, we probably prefer not to do that. Now, you mentioned fixing deeds is a really common one. I know in a conversation we had, um, we've talked about a little bit about deed types in some other videos. You know, the best is a warranty deed, a special warranty deed is, you know, second to that. And then there's these quit claims. Now, what, what issues have you ever faced with people um, that were selling land they've inherited to you when you had to deal with fixing a deed uh, document? Yeah, so a lot. A lot can go wrong in the chain of title, um, all the way down to just transcription errors. Uh, so sometimes the legal description, the... Uh, every property has a legal description to that property. Sometimes it's meets and bounds. Sometimes it's lots in a subdivision. Um, sometimes it's just uh, even had, I've even seen stuff like near this, tree, like really bizarre stuff in legal descriptions. But so this is not the actual property address then? Yeah, it's not an address. A lot of vacant land doesn't have an address because there's no residence on it. Oftentimes, you know, way out in the sticks, there's no utilities, anything. So there's no mail getting delivered there. So there's no address. Um, but that legal description is unique to that property. Um, and it has to be written down and recorded verbatim over and over again. But what happens is oftentimes... Um, there's transcription errors. They might've put the wrong lot number. They might have you know, moved a decimal around in a meets and bounds, whatever it might be. Sometimes you're trying to track back ownership of a property and you find out that that legal description is kind of changing or even the acreage is changing going back and forth on the deed. Um, this especially is common when there's like a family property and they've kind of cut off chunks of it and sold it over time to other people. Um, oftentimes those changes aren't correctly recorded. So all the way down to the very basics, uh, basic description of the property, the legal description and the acreage can be incorrect. Um, there's gaps in title, which are very common, meaning at some point somebody filed a deed saying this person owned it, but the person before that person has no proof that they owned it. So that deed might exist. It might be floating out in the ether somewhere, but if it's not recorded at the county, um, you are not going to have a marketable deed uh, or marketable 
ability to sell that property and say, hey, there, this is absolutely a clear chain of title. So we've had to have people go back through digging in closets, um, you know, storage units where, you know, somebody passed away and all their papers from their office are just shoved into a storage room somewhere um, and actually try to go retrieve a physical deed that was signed and notarized uh, decades ago at times and get that filed with the county to actually prove that somewhere back in the lineage of ownership, this member actually was deeded the property. Um, yeah. So gaps in title, that's a big one. And then finally, there's deed types. Um, and there's a lot of deed types. And further you go in, you realize there's a, it, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, your best one is called a general warranty deed or a warranty deed that states, when I sell you this property, this is all we issue for my company, for example. When I issue you this property, I am guaranteeing, I'm warranting that there are no liens or encumbrances. There are no issues in the chain of title to this date of me handing you ownership of this property. Um, one thing, one of the deed types that's kind of scary uh, for us, anytime we see it on a deed search uh, is a quit claim deed. And what that quit claim deed is saying, in effect, it is providing no warranty or guarantee that this property has a clear chain of title. Um, there are sometimes okay uses of a quit claim deed. Oftentimes that's family to family. Uh, say I wanted to just give my brother some land. In Texas, you can write up a quit claim deed that says, you know, for equitable sum of $10 or whatever else, I am handing ownership of this property from one family member to another. In our research, if we see something that's like sibling to sibling on a quit claim deed, that's no problem. But when you see it move from one family to another family or from one business to, a, that's when you start really trying to dig in and find out, may, is there some lien or encumbrance I'm missing? Is there a deed of trust that isn't fully paid off? There's very, there's a higher chance, a much higher chance that there's something wrong with that chain of title that we yeah, need to really quick, dig into. Quit claim doesn't even necessarily guarantee that you held ownership in it. Like it's quitting any claim I have if I have any. Um, so you mentioned a couple of things like the legal description. That's very important. I have seen as well where people try to deed a property between themselves, kind of the old do it yourself, not pay an attorney type. Um, and so it's like, I'll just deed this to my child or to my heir or to whoever, myself. And they'd get kind of a do it yourself deed packet. And for the legal description, they would look up on the tax bill. And the tax bill always has a shortened, abbreviated legal description. So it won't say the northwest quarter of the north half of section 122 township block, et cetera. It'll say like NW one, one slash four. You know, and, you know, and it, it'll it'll shorten that because obviously with the tax bill, they just need a reference point because they're just charging. This is under, important to understand that the county clerk or recorder's office is a separate division in a municipality than the taxing agency. So even though they're related, the taxing agency uses abbreviations. So people will get those abbreviations and they'll put that on the deed as if it were the legal description. And then oftentimes that then is not insurable title. Meaning if I go to sell it to you, and you want to buy title insurance and close to a title company, they'll say, we can't insure that because that deed has to be fixed. I've had that happen on very valuable properties and people couldn't sell it without doing a lot of cleanup work. So don't do the deed yourself. <laughs> Have a professional do the deed and the legal description, obviously. Um, and then that needs to be reviewed now we do work closely with local title companies um, and the title examiners that will go and look at all these things. I imagine uh, you, you have a, a solid person doing that with, within your team as well, Logan. Um, with the quick claims, we've also noticed, for instance, you, you mentioned you do a lot of deals in the state of Texas. I know I do some myself. Texas hates quick claims. And most title companies in Texas will not insure title on a quick claim. So even you mentioned the proper use is if you and your brother inherited land from someone together and you say, I don't want the land, I'll quit claim my half to you, brother. The brother goes to sell it. And I've had this happen buying land in Texas for people that inherited it. And they said, no, we've got to go get your brother to execute a general warranty deed. And so uh, those things do matter and they need to be fixed 
um, or you won't essentially be able to sell your property. So this is a, probably a very valuable point when people are trying to sell land that they've inherited. What are the benefits of working with a land investor like yourself that's a professional or with your company? <clears throat> yeah, you get a number of them. So first, the biggest one is that we have kind of that hard-earned trench warfare knowledge of how difficult it would be to actually get a clean marketable title out of a inherited, poorly inherited structure. Um, so what well, it takes me and my team maybe 10 to 15 minutes to analyze a chain of title to see, to really ultimately compare it to the value of the property and de determine is this property pretty even worth enough to go through this process to clean up title for either us if we're trying to buy it or for the seller who's trying to sell it um, because the properties that are most commonly neglected are the lower price point properties so you know a property that may be worth 20 or thirty thousand uh, for us if it's going to take a lot of time to clean up uh, that title in order to get a marketable uh, ownership in it when we purchase it then we can we'll just know the, the amount of money and manpower and expertise and things that we might have to leverage to do that might outweigh the value of the property in the end or so, I mean, basically even the, you're able to give people an honest opinion in, in evaluating their property right because i mean that's one thing that i value is if if it's you know if the bite's not worth the chew are we going to continue or am I going to waste your time? All right, so Logan, what you're what I hear you saying is that basically by working with uh, a professional land investor, one of the benefits is that you're able to quickly evaluate the situation and give people a, a perspective and an opinion based on experience, hands-on experience, to determine if, it, if the bite is worth the chew, if it's worth them following through with, with the sale or what they can do. Like triage you know how quickly can we give you an honest answer and really an honest answer that includes a lot of knowledge that we have regarding the quickest and most way to do this um oftentimes if you go to an attorney they're not going to have the same motivation to move quickly and affordably to do this process they may only know this is the standard way that i've been doing it and I worked on an hourly rate, so maybe it's going to take me 20 or 30 hours to get this done, whatever the yeah. case might be. So, yeah, you get the benefit of an honest opinion and then quick, affordable solutions that we know are tried and true because we've done it so many times. So a good, a good benefit there for a person selling inherited land is that a land investor is in the business of buying land, um, not making money on legal fees, not trying to list your land. We're not realtors or, or, or attorneys. So you're going to use your team in the most effective way possible to try to help them find the favorable outcome, which is to be able to actually sell the property, right? <clears throat> right. And also having a title company that really understands creative solutions and is willing to go through maybe a little bit more complication to issue um, an equitable title is really important as well. We work hard to find and vet those title companies. If you go to any random title company, you may not, you may just have to say, no, there's no way that we can do this. Uh, when really another title company that's more experienced will be able to. Yeah. I mean, I've found uh, title companies of real estate attorneys sometimes want an easy button. They're looking for an easy solution. And whereas, you know, with working with a land investor, we have the determination to be able to try to make that transaction happen for you.
Perfect. So Logan, uh, to just kind of a quick uh, summarize quickly what you mentioned, I heard you say that, you know, working with a land investor, number one, you have in the trenches experience. And so land investors, we've helped dozens of other people deal with situations like this. And obviously there's a motivation because we are in the business of buying land, not of talking about buying land, not of charging you hourly rates of for legal fees or research on it. And so um, you're going to leverage, uh, when you work with a land investor, the land investors like ourselves leverage experience, but we also leverage our team and the efficiency that we've built in place to try to bring a solution to uh, the person who's inherited land and is selling it. Uh, another aspect that kind of comes to my mind too is the old buyer's remorse for dealing with uh, consumers is, you know, we are researching the property. We're determining a value that we know we can offer you in cash for the property. Whereas if you're good to go to try and sell it on the open market, and then there's some sort of an issue that needs to be resolved, often uh, people won't be that patient. And so um, if the closing process extends because there's an issue that needs to be solved, those buyers disappear and you're starting over again, and you can definitely lose that momentum and waste a lot of time. So working with a, a land investor could definitely be a good solution, particularly if you have a difficult uh, situation, um, you, land you've inherited or you're not clear, there's a question mark around it. Uh, just from talking to you, Logan, uh, with uh, prime land buyers and other land investors connected here in our network at inheritedland.com, you can see uh, that very definitely, you're definitely very knowledgeable, have the experience and have the team, most of all, uh, to make these uh, sales and transactions happen. So thank you for being with us uh, here today. Logan, we really appreciate your knowledge and experience and the stories that you've shared. <clears throat> Any final words to uh, people who are uh, researching land that they've inherited? Yeah, I would just say, get started sooner rather than later. Um, if you have even an inclination of wanting to sell this property someday, uh, postponing doesn't make things easier. The further we have to go back and dig and go through records and getting in touch with people and other family members passing away, it gets more and it gets progressively more complicated uh, and harder to solve and clear up inheritance issues the longer you wait to do it. So I would engage quickly if you do have interest or even concerns that a property that you inherited uh, might not be saleable. Perfect. Great advice. Thank you so much for being here uh, today on the show, uh, inheritedland.com. If you are looking to sell your property and you'd like a free consultation, you'd like uh, someone from our team to hop on a call with you, gather a little information and evaluate that property, click below, fill out the form, send us your information and someone from our team will reach out for a free consultation. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.